brought to you by Brand South Africa. The 2012 World Economic Forum Africa, which took place at uh, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia last week, focused on many primary issues, with one of them being intra-Africa trade. Godfrey Machizwa spoke to Transnet CEO Brian Molefe for a look at the, the role into this and more. Well, there have been a lot of discussions about the funding for infrastructure. There's a lot of discussion about why we need infrastructure. Uh, because we can't build infrastructure for the sake of building infrastructure. And what has come out is that the African continent needs to industrialize right. uh, to, to allow trade between African countries. Because if one country is producing copper and another one is producing iron ore, right. there's no need for two African countries to, to trade. I'm reading Zambia and South Africa. Zambia and South Africa is an example, yes. Yeah. But we export the copper and the iron or to China or to some other countries. So they, the other countries take our God-given resources and make money out of it. And then we have to pay for those. And then we have to pay for them. So the big thing that is coming out is Africa needs to industrialize so that uh, we can trade amongst ourselves. We can exchange commodities and trap capital on the African continent. Yeah. So, now, and, and that will become available for building, uh, 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 creating jobs in the factories yeah. and creating a middle class. Now for that of course to happen it needs political will and with that political will then needs, there, there needs to be the planning that's, that's required to make sure that that happens. What's your sense from the discussions that you're getting here? Is there that political will and also to take it further than just political will and actually implement it in terms of plans? I think the political will is there. I mean I was in a discussion with uh, 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 where Prime Minister Mendes of Ethiopia was there and yesterday uh, pr uh, President uh, Goodluck Jonathan from Nigeria and both of them have emphatically made this point that we need to industrialize we need to take the public sector must provide the infrastructure that will allow industrialization to take place yeah. because we need to trade amongst each other as Africans the other other issue is uh, intra African tourism yeah. because uh, you know the people that have money on the continent when they go on holiday they go overseas now that's capital outflows we need to find ways of trapping capital yeah. in the continent yeah. so that we can create jobs and fight poverty yeah. on the continent yeah now of course Brian part of the problem is that not many countries have got industrialization policies I mean South Africa announced it is one last year Nigeria is talking about putting together an industrial plan to try and make sure that they, they, they have the industry and they beneficiate some of the raw materials. Mm -hmm. How do we get these governments at a pan-African level yeah. to plan together so that this infrastructure when it's built, it's not Transnet building a railway line to the to Limpopo Bridge and then uh, hoping the NRZ in Zimbabwe picks it up from there. Now we in Africa have to move very fast on the, this issue of uh, industrialization and yeah. I think that it is a, a topic perhaps that uh, the AU must take up. Uh, in the peer review mechanisms and in the other structures of the AU, yeah. uh, the issue of industrialization. I think, I think, in my opinion, it becomes more important than infrastructure itself, right. because infrastructure uh, is not an end in it on itself. You yeah. can't build a, a bridge where there is no water, where True. there is no river. True. So we can't be talking about building bridges. We must be talking about why we need particular infrastructure. Yeah. And if we have to prioritize. We must know what our priorities are. Yeah. Let's bring the conversation back home to South Africa. Now, of course, you are on a big program yourselves, the 300 billion infrastructure uh, program to make sure that South Africa is efficient. Now, can you give us an update in terms of the financing for that project, the bulk of the money? Where is that coming from and over what sort of time frames? Well, the, the 300 billion will be financed by... Uh, roughly about 100 billion of uh, loans but you know in at the, at the from the capital markets from the capital markets so we issue transnet bonds both yeah. domestic and foreign <coughs> and then we'll top it up with some uh, other <coughs> loans from uh, the, uh, clubs of banks and other uh, uh, private placements and so on so we, we don't have a, a big issue with raising the, the yeah. hundred in fact it's 86 billion but 86. conservatively we say a hundred uh, because you know you can change your borrowing plan sometimes yeah, sure. and the 200 billion will come from own resources so we are moving more commodities the government is allowing us to keep all the profits that we make uh, there's a zero dividend policy and over the next seven years we will generate about 200 billion from better uh, more better efficiencies and moving more volumes how, our long, system. how long is that zero dividend policy going to continue for Brian 
Well, for now, I've got a five-year contract, so okay. I'm happy you are, that. You're talking <laughs> within your contract? Okay. Yes, but I think later on, I mean, when the infrastructure is in place, yeah. and when Transnet does not know what to do with capital, yeah. uh, perhaps uh, there can be dividends out of Transnet. I'm sure there will be more demands on it. But let's talk about also this perception, because with the whole Sunrail debacle, there's a suggestion among other people's minds that it's going to become increasingly difficult for state-owned state entities to go and raise money from the capital markets because of the issue that has arisen around the credit risk of uh, state-owned enterprises. Do you think that's going to affect you and are you likely to find that your, when you go to market your, 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 your pricing for your bonds is going to be maybe higher than it should be? No, I don't think investors are concerned about the Sunrail issues at, at the Sunrail issue at the moment. Moody's did downgrade uh, Sunrail. Yeah, uh, but, but, yeah, but uh, not the sovereign. Uh, okay, there was a, a, a down, downward uh, downgrade of the sovereign because of uh, the uh, other issues. Yeah, yeah, because of uh, uh, other issues. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, Sunrail is not mentioned at all in that downgrade of the sovereign. So, I, I don't think investors are really concerned because they know that we have sufficient resources in our treasury, uh, if push comes to shove, to avoid a default uh, on those uh, on those debts. But uh, more importantly, investors are always interested in the respect of the rule of law. And in this instance, I mean, the, ma the matter went to court, the judge has pronounced on it, and there is respect for what uh, the judge has said. And so everybody is, uh, has calmed down, they're looking at the issue again. And so investors like that. Investors want to know that there is uh, an independent sort of body that can look at these disputes uh, and, uh, and, and adjudicate and come out with a, 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 pro a process that everybody will respect in the end. So that is quite critical uh, in any... Because what investors worry about is when uh, there's a default which is coupled with uh, uh, the absence of the rule of law and where contracts are no longer enforceable because you don't have a judiciary that can enforce them.